I'd like to call to order the Tuesday, October 20, 2020 meeting of the Sheboygan County Board. Are we in compliance with the open meeting law? Yes, we are. The agenda was posted on October 16th at 2.30 p.m. Okay, next item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Next is roll call. There are 23 supervisors present. Okay, next item is the approval of the September 15, 2020 journal. Good. Supervisor Prochak. I move for approval of the journal as printed. Thank you, Supervisor Prochak. Supervisor Obler. That motion. Thank you, Supervisor Obler. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing no lights, please vote on approving the journal. The journal is approved unanimously. Next is the consideration of appointments by the chairperson. To Bay Lakes Regional Planning Commission, Rebecca <coughs> Clark. Is a new appointment and Edward Prochek's reappointment. Supervisor Gehring. Mr. Chairman, I move to concur with your appointments. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Hoffman. I would like to second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Hoffman. Is there any discussion? There's no discussion. Please vote on the appointments. Appointments are approved unanimously. Next are presentations. First up, Brian Grunewald from Clifton Larson Allen with the 2019 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. All right, I'm Brian Grunewald with uh, Clifton Larson Allen. Uh, thanks for having me here this evening. I feel like it's the first time I've been here undercover. Uh, so just want to take a minute and circle back, focus on 2019 and the conclusion of 2019 with, uh, with the discussion on the audit results. Uh, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free uh, to ask. Okay, this first slide, just want to give a brief recap or summary of the audit results. Um, the first bullet point there, focusing on the audit of the basic financial statements. Uh, as you can see, that is an unmodified opinion. Essentially means that the financial statements, the comprehensive annual financial report is complete and accurate and in accordance with our professional standards. The, uh, the second bullet point there, focusing on the report on internal control over financial reporting. Um, as a part of every audit process, we do consider the organization's internal control structure. Uh, for example, how they pay their bills, how they handle cash. Um, happy to report from an internal control standpoint. No issues, no concerns, no findings. And then the, uh, the last item there, focusing on federal and state aid. Uh, from, a fe from a federal and state aid perspective, again, no issues, no concerns. Uh, we do perform tests of compliance with regards to those dollars. We are not aware of any issues or concerns with regards to uh, compliance. 
So certainly all good news in terms of uh, the results of your audit. And then in addition to the audit review that CLA completes, you also voluntarily go through and have an additional review that is completed by the Government uh, Finance Officers Association. So this is just an excerpt, a copy of the award that you received for excellence in financial reporting. Uh, this is for the year ended two, uh, 2018. Um, you have applied for the 2019 award and based on our review, I fully expect that you will also receive that award for 2019, but just wanted to take a moment and congratulate you on uh, receiving that award again. And this next slide just gives you an overview of the financial condition and certainly there's a lot of information here, but there's a lot of positive information when you think of the financial results uh, of the county. The, uh, the first bullet point there is focusing on your fund balance or your equity reserves for your tax levy supported funds. Um, certainly I've got some additional slides on this. You do have a fund balance policy. I'll talk more about that in a minute. From a fund balance perspective, you continue to be in real strong financial condition uh, in terms of how you manage and monitor those funds. Then just wanted to give you a brief recap here from Rocky Knoll's perspective, whether you look at their net position or their equity, uh, you had an increase in that of 653,000. You can also step back and look at their cash balances. Your cash balances did increase by over a million dollars. Uh, so certainly a strong year for Rocky Knoll. Uh, from highways perspective there too, you also see increases in your net position or your equity reserves of 2.6 million. Um, and then another increase in your working capital I do have a slide on that as well. Your working capital is looking at your current assets, things like cash, in addition to your accounts receivable, what people owe you versus what you owe others in terms of outstanding bills. That increased by $682,000. Your employee benefits, insurance, internal service fund, uh, that did decrease. Uh, the net position, the equity, as well as your working capital did decrease, but that is consistent with your plan and your budget. Um, and then the last two bullet points are just take, take, taking a step back and looking at general obligation debt. Again, keep in mind this is as of 1231-19. I know there's been some changes or will be changes in 2020. Uh, but as of the end of 2019, outstanding general obligation debt balance of 30.2 million. From a statutory reporting perspective, certainly very low in comparison to that statutory reporting limit. Um, your outstanding debt at the end of 2019 represented about 5.9% of that statutory debt limit. And then I also like to look at uh, repayments. How quickly are you repaying principal? The last bullet point there is focusing on your repayment of principal uh, over the next five years. Again, this is as of the agreements in places of 1231-19, you are scheduled to repay 78% uh, of the outstanding principal balance. So a lot of positive financial information there. Then I just want to take a step back and focus on your fund balance. And this is looking just at your general fund. Um, I always like to look at trends in your history. And clearly you can see in the graph here, and there's a lot of information. But um, from an overall fund balance dollars perspective, I mean, you can see a, a lot of consistency from 2017, 18, and 19. Uh, you've been in the 21.5 to 21.3 million in terms of your overall uh, fund balance. The chart at the bottom shows you those balances by the different categories that we use to account for those dollars. Um, and there is additional information or detail on pages 69 to 71 of your comprehensive annual finance report if you do want to look at the details of that further. Um, the one that I just want to focus on is that unassigned category. That's the amount that's available for working capital and contingency reserves. Uh, you can see the fluctuation there. You were at 18.6 million back in 2015 approximately 18.5 at the end of 2018, and then at 17.9 at the end of 2019. I know I'm going through this pretty quickly. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. So then this slide is just honing in on that unassigned category. So the county's policy is geared towards that unassigned balance. How much do you have? How much do you have in comparison to the expenditure budget and the dollars flowing through that uh, from an expenditure standpoint? From a policy perspective, you can see the minimum and maximum defined as 30% and 15%. The red line is your actual experience for the last several years. When I look at this, I think it's interesting that your actual experience 
I mean, you're staying pretty close to the middle uh, of your policy. At the end of 2019, you're at 21%. Uh, and clearly when that policy was evaluated and designed, it was meant to be a benchmark uh, in terms of where the, fund, the county fund balance wants to be. You're, you're right in line with your, with your policy and doing a great job of managing where you're at. Then I just wanted to give you a little more history here. So here we're moving on to Rocky Knoll. And again, I mentioned working capital before. This is looking at current assets versus current liabilities. Uh, when you look at this, you can see the steady growth um, in the working capital over the last five years. From 2018 to 2019, uh, that did increase over a million dollars. Certainly another positive financial indicator. On that summary slide, I talked about your net position as well as your tax. I mean, all three of these items are moving in a positive direction. Here we're moving on to the highway department, again, focusing on that working capital. Um, and here too as well, I mean, you can see the growth. Um, you, you can see the growth, but I also like to focus on how much do you have when you step back and look at a working capital amount of 4.8 million. Uh, again, certainly strong from a county highway department's perspective, you're ending cash balance uh, at the end of, of 2019, uh, just under 2.2 million. And here we move into the employee benefits uh, fund. Again, focusing on your working capital. You can see the, the decreases for the last few years, 17, 18, 19. Again, that's all in accordance with your budget and your plan. Um, again, circling back to 2019. I know for 2020, uh, you did budget a use of just over a million dollars uh, for that as well. Um, from a cash perspective and equity perspective, at the end of 2019, your cash balance was uh, 7 million 23,000 and your equity at, at just over 6 million. So certainly strong reserves there. And then I just have a couple of slides that I wanted to present some debt information. And again, I understand this, this is changing here. So this is as of 1231-19, just gives you a snapshot of the history of what your outstanding balances have been. Uh, back in 2015, you had approximately 38.6 million. You carry that across at the end of 2018, approximately 36.8. Uh, and at the end of 2019, you're at a balance of $30.2 million. And one way that I always like to look at debt is when you look at the repayment of debt, what are your debt service, your principal and interest expenses, and how does that relate to the county's budget? So as a percentage of your non-capital expenditures, um, you can see that the blue line here, you've been in the 10, uh, nine to 10% range in terms of uh, your debt service as a percent of those non-capital expenditures ended 2019 at 9%. Um, from a benchmarking perspective, bond rating agencies certainly look at this. You know, their common benchmark is the red line there, that 20%. So clearly, clearly you're well uh, below that. And then as part of the audit process, I mean, the Governmental Accounting Standard Board has been busy. They continue to be busy. They did defer or extend the implementation dates uh, of several standards. These are only two. There's several more that are out there. You know, we will work closely with the county to make sure that all of those standards uh, are properly implemented as we move forward. And I know I went through that pretty quickly. Um, if anyone does have any questions, I certainly would entertain those you know again in closing you're, you're doing things the right way um, from a budget perspective from a compliance perspective and when you step back and look at those financial results again I know I went through that very quickly but there's a lot of things in there that are extremely positive and when you step back and look at county government one of the challenges is all the different types of activities that you have meaning your general fund your highway your human service fund uh, there's certainly a lot of positive financial information when I step back and look at the, the county as a whole. Any thoughts, questions, concerns? There's no questions. Well, thank you very much. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. That's great. Great. Next up, me. <laughs> so I was asked to give uh, update uh, plans and preparations for Election Day. Adam and Vern asked and uh, which I'm more than welcome to share. One of the things that we've been working on 
uh, are, is training for poll workers. And I do uh, chief inspector training, baseline chief inspector training, and then the municipal clerks do actual poll worker training for their needs at the polling locations. Because each clerk has different sites. The city has, I uh, see Vicki nodding her head, the city has eight polling sites. So they have different training needs uh, than, say, the town of Russell, which just has their, their small town hall. So that's been, that is ongoing throughout the years as needed uh, for the different poll workers to meet the need. One need that came up, um, town of Greenbush needed a couple, two to three poll workers for November. And that need was splashed out there to a lot of uh, groups and that need has been filled, uh, thankfully. Um, the minimum on election age, so if you were ever, ever asking, which you probably never did, the minimum of poll workers needed on election day is three, so you can open the polls. They always typically have twice that, they have different shifts throughout the day, but the clerks do a great job at keeping that number up there. So since April, that hit everyone, um, as you know, uh, at this level, um, but the municipal clerks and the municipal boards um, to try to get enough PPEs, cleaning supplies and whatnot in very short order. The Elections Commission through the state was able to provide a lot. So since April, a lot of fine tuning took place at the municipalities gearing up for August, which was um, um, a great practice run, if you will, for what we're going to see in November. And plexiglass partitions, similar to what we have here, a lot of PPE, cleaning, sanitation supplies uh, that came from the state, masks, gloves, hand sanitizers, um, sanitizing wipes, sanitizing spray bottles, paper toweling, alcohol wipes, um, additional signage for the distancing and whatnot. Pens, uh, everyone was using pens that the voter could just take with them. And the vast majority of that came through the Elections Commission. I'm sure it was through a Federal CARES uh, Act uh, granting uh, mechanism. But, and then in the interim, the local municipalities just stepped up and filled the void where there were specific needs. One wanted more gloves than another. Uh, so they just went and found those on by, them, by themselves. So absentee ballot delivery started September 16th. I don't know if a lot of you know that. It starts very early for a federal election for overseas and military voters. They have to, the ballots get sent out 47 days before an election. So my office, the municipal clerks, they've been working since September 16th, uh, actually on the November election. Um, so let's see some of the things they did to increase elector access a lot of the towns added a drop box where there wasn't one in the past um, the city of sheboygan added a larger drop box west of mead library so you can drive through with any absentees there's additional office hours i know that the city added some Saturday hours, which they've never done in the past. So each municipality stepped up and tried to get even more access because they knew the tidal wave of in-person absentee and just absentee voting in general was coming because of all the talk about the distrust with the Postal Service. So today was the first day for in-person absentee voting. There were lines. At City, uh, all three cities, town of Wilson, town of Sheboygan, and so it's interesting because they were they were coming today to avoid the lines that they thought are going to be there on November third, which is kind of ironic. Um, so with that, and with the increase in the media, you're getting inundated in your mailbox from parties, the political parties, League of Women Voters, other entities that are encouraging everyone to vote absentee. And so 
some of the clerks think they're going to have 50 to 60 percent of their voters already taken care of before the polls open on November 3rd. So November 3rd, you know, they're, they're going to be busy this week and next week for the two weeks of in-person absentee. Uh, but on November 3rd, the poll uh, locations are going to be kind of light, kind of like in April or a typical April election, um, which is a good thing. Um, and but the numbers are still up there, which is also a good thing. People aren't staying home. They're like they did in April. It caught off people off guard because it came so quick. A lot of people didn't have time to vote absentee or thought they didn't have time to vote absentee. So this time people were voting absentee. Some of them voted so early absentee they didn't remember and they're coming in to vote again because they voted absentee so long ago, which is kind of funny. They're not trying to vote twice intentionally. Um, so we'll lighten the load at polling locations on election day. Um, cybersecurity has been important also with a lot of this misinformation campaigns that are out there at any level. So we are, um, it's a free service um, that we have through the EIISAC. It's the Elections Infrastructure Information Sharing Analysis Center. And they send tips and best practices frequently. And they have call-ins um, that we can take advantage of, but I, I'm able to forward those to the municipal clerks. So if they have an in-home office, which many of them do, they can follow these uh, best practices when you're working out of your home for cybersecurity. Um, so the last thing I wanted to touch on was just a quick um, absentee versus mail-in. A lot of people here in the radio watch TV. It's a national show, so they're talking about mail-in voting. We don't have mail-in voting in Wisconsin. You can ask for an absentee to be mailed to you, and you mail it back, but that is not the equivalent of what you're hearing in the media as mail-in voting. Mail-in voting, like the state of Oregon, there is no polling location on election day. Everything is absentee. Every registered voter gets a ballot sent to you. That is mail-in. So when you hear that, just realize Wisconsin doesn't have that. So in summary, we have 28 municipal clerks. Uh, there's two elections already under their belts during this pandemic. Lots of practice. They're all very confident that this is gonna go um, very well. And with those two under our belt, We've had no complaints, COVID-related, pandemic-related, from any municipality. Uh, now, there might have been out there, there might be complaints out there, but none have come to the clerks and none have come to me, which is, which is great. That means the electors are very confident and feel comfortable and safe when they're going to the polling locations. Um, and the clerks, uh, need a pat on the back because they are all making sure they're getting a lot of phone calls prior to what are you doing and all the clerks are stepping up and making sure that all of their electors feel safe so um, I guess can I ask if there's any questions I don't need to take up too much time so you can go and vote absentee what is the procedure for tabulating the absentee ballots on election day? All right. So, Kurt Brower votes absentee. Whether it's in person or mail, he sticks in an envelope and it goes back to the clerk. Either in a drop box or in person, you still put it in an envelope and hand it to the clerk or clerk staff. So then on election day, uh, Vicky's work in the polls and they take that envelope they state your name and address state your name and address just like the voter is standing there uh, voting in person so they state your name address slice the envelope open sometimes they slice the ballot in half and have to remake it but then that gets sent through the tabulator so on that, that I'm glad you mentioned that, some of the municipalities, three actually, 
stepped up and bought another tabulator just to process the absentees. So they can have three or more poll workers at that machine just processing the boatload of absentees that they're going to have on election day. So that all starts at 7. Nothing's changed with there were some bills trying to start that earlier. Not, nothing's happening for November 3rd. Um, but they, they state your name and address because there are observers there that are listening and they have a list from their party or whatever group they're there for and they are checking you off uh, their list. So that's why it, they actually physically say your name and address just like you were there in person. Any other questions? Great. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Next are public addresses. Uh, we have none. Okay, then letters, communications, and announcements. There are two. Two ordinances. The, uh, I'm sorry, resolutions. The first is from Brown County Board of Supervisors requesting the state senate reconvene to address 13 water bills passed by the assembly. We'll receive that for information. I believe that we've had that multiple times. And lastly, I have one from the Winnebago County Board of Supervisors supporting pending legislation to amend hearing timelines for juveniles taken into custody. Okay, we'll send that to Health and Human Services. That is all. Okay. Now it's County Administrator's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. It feels anticlimactic to touch on the 2021 proposed budget. This evening, they're on your desks. And uh, normally, the budget would probably be the absolute foremost topic on our minds. I mean, it supports 850 employees working in over 19 departments, administering over 207 programs and services from A to Z with law enforcement, health and human services, an airport, planning and resources, the county clerk's office, you name it. And yet uh, it's not foremost on our minds. It's not. But it is so nice to sit here year after year and hear a positive report about our overall financial performance, isn't it? For the newer board members here this evening, perhaps you haven't heard our auditor provide that report in the past, but I can tell you that it's not uncommon to hear a favorable report like that. And it's because of, it's because of our team. Finance Chair, Chairman Gehring, and the Finance Committee that does so much of the heavy lifting with the budget year after year, and all of the committees, everyone who has a role in developing a budget and making sure we're holding one another accountable to work within those budget parameters. When I think about the department heads here, I couldn't be more grateful and proud of our team. Their track record, our track record, is outstanding. Second to none in this state, as far as I'm concerned. And I hope everyone, when you hear a report like that, well, it's, it's another report, another day at the office. But our track record, our financial strength, the decisions we have collectively made to serve this community and do so in a fiscally responsible manner, it matters. It's important. And I hope you uh, all take some pride in that because you're all a part of it. The proposed 2021 budget that's before you, it's a $150 million budget. Of course, about $51 million of that is direct property taxes. The rest is state and federal revenue, um, fees that we receive, private income that we receive at Rocky Knoll, but it's a $150 million budget. Of that $51 million property tax levy, of course, that's the area that our community in particular is very concerned about. They want to see property taxes kept in check. They elect you to be fiscally responsible and provide services, but keep those property taxes in check. How, how's the board been doing? How have we been doing? 
when the proposed 2021 budget, you're looking at a 1.5% increase, 1.56% to be specific. We're capturing the net new construction through new growth and development in the community, through our homes being uh, valued higher. We're capturing that. And that is what we're utilizing to continue our operations. One and a half percent increase. If you look at the tax rate, it's actually going down. It's going down 26 cents from $5.22 this year to $4.96 next. So on, on a $100,000 home, for example, your property taxes will decrease approximately $26. In fact, the 2021 budget reflects the fifth consecutive year that the property tax rate has gone down or will go down. Fifth consecutive year. So, of course, we want to see property tax rates kept in check. It's nicer to see them go down, certainly, than up. But where the rubber meets the road is with that ongoing levy, the operational levy. And what's been happening there? If you look at the last 10, 12 years, on average, we've seen just over a 1% increase a year. There aren't many businesses or households that have operated with a 1% increase in revenue a year. So I'm proud of that, and it's, again, it's a reflection of our team and our collaboration and uh, what Bill Gehring and Vern Koch and Roger Testrudi and Thomas Wagner and others have told me is a very effective budget process. By the time we get to this point, everyone has had an opportunity for input. Everyone has had an opportunity to ask questions, to make suggestions, to seek refinements. So thank you for your work. And I encourage you to review the document. If you have any questions, uh, please don't wait till the last meeting uh, next the next uh, county board meeting, we'll have our public hearing. We'll take any input. Certainly questions can be raised at that time. The department heads will be available, but we're going to want to do that in a safe manner. But if you start reviewing this and you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Don't hesitate to contact uh, Finance Director Wendy Sharnan. Don't hesitate to contact one of your peers on the board who you know is on that oversight committee. Uh, let's get your questions answered. On your desk is a news release that we put out. I'm not going to go through that all because next week is really when we formally introduce the budget. But again, I encourage you to review it when you have an opportunity. Please review the budget. And my compliments to everyone involved who helped prepare it. What is on our minds, of course, is COVID. Last week, I was so grateful to be able to take some time off and go on an elk hunt with my dad, my 81-year-old dad, sixth generation here in Sheboygan County. I'm seventh generation. And we went out west, went to Steamboat, Colorado. We've never done this before. Never spent a week together before driving out and back. And of course, he's hunkered down with COVID. My parents, I think like many of our parents, grandparents, many of us in this room perhaps, we're being very cautious. And he was skeptical about going. It was a last minute opportunity for both of us. And he was skeptical. And uh, ultimately he decided, let's do this. It was going to be a rare opportunity for the two of us to spend some quality time together. And we were gonna be in the car alone out and back. We were gonna be hunting in the wilderness. Pretty safe opportunity to take a trip if you're gonna take one, right? And on the way out, of course we had to stop at gas stations. We didn't go to any restaurants. We packed all our food and sandwiches and took that all along. We had one overnight stay on the way there, one overnight stay on the way back. And everywhere we stopped, everywhere we had to you know, interact with people throughout that trip, just about everyone I saw was wearing a mask. When we stopped at the hotels, they were very careful about cleaning off the front desk when we stopped, handing us a pen and telling us to keep it or wiping it off when we returned it. You could just tell people were mindful. And of course, that gave me some comfort and gave my dad some comfort. But I'll readily admit, though we had a wonderful, wonderful father-son trip, I felt a little guilt, guilty about leaving Sheboygan County when we're seeing the kind of increase that we're seeing in COVID cases. 
and knowing that our public health staff were all hands on deck dealing with this. All the contact tracing that's going on, our nursing home and just everybody. And uh, when I returned, of course, the first meeting we had Monday, Chairman Koch and I and Stark Grossman, our public health officer, our corporation counsel, our health and human services director, our, our health and human services, public health information officer, we all got together and we, we talked about what's happening. I mean, most people should know what's happening, right? You go to the daily update on our website, if you're watching the news, if you're paying attention to this community, most people should know what's happening. COVID spiking. Our hospitals are seeing more and more patients. And it's putting increasing pressure not only in our hospitals, but our nursing homes, our assisted living facilities, our businesses, our families, our schools, our places of worship. Everybody is feeling more pressure. Community spread is occurring now at a level that none of us are comfortable with. We come here and look at the precautions we're taking. Bless everyone's heart for being part of the solution. The precautions we've taken in Sheboygan County for months, make an appointment, masks required, social distancing. Over 240 of our 850 employees are working remotely from home. We've all been trying to do our part to keep one another safe, our community safe. But even all those best efforts, we now have COVID in our detention center. We have COVID in the clerk of court's office. We have COVID in the district attorney's office, family court commissioner office, building services department, Rocky Knoll, transportation, HR. At least half of our departments now have employees that either contracted the virus or have been in contact, close contact with someone and have had to quarantine. It's impacting all of us, including our essential workers who we rely upon to respond to emergencies or keep the detainees where they need to stay. It's impacting all of us. And every day, it seems like we're talking about contingency plans and backup. As I was listening to the, the county clerk give a nice update here a few minutes ago, I thought to myself, what if he and his staff get COVID the week of elections? What's our contingency plan there? Some of us, oh, well, I won't be that sick. I can work from home. Really? Is that what happens to everybody? We know better, don't we? So we are constantly talking about contingency plans, back, back up, helping one another. We have to have correctional officers. We have to have nurses and CNAs and people caring for our, our elderly. It is challenging. I see our HR director with us tonight, Dennis, who uh, I think he, I think we hired what, hired you in February, Dennis? Thereabouts, I mean, he just got thrown into this. And I think some of you have heard me say this before, but Dennis did a remarkable job his first six, eight weeks working with our team, working with Corporation Council and myself and others, reviewing all of our HR benefits and, and how we're going to handle this if people are out and FMLA and vacation. And I mean, all sorts of refinements were made. And he continues to work closely with departments to help with this contingency planning and being sure we have backup. Our public health staff, I've said this a number of times, but it, they're absolutely remarkable what they're dealing with. Absolutely remarkable. Right now, good Lord, do they, are they inundated with calls and people who have contracted the virus and doing the tracing and, and we're, we're losing the battle. We can't keep up. Many counties have already stepped away from it because they can't keep up. We're still trying. Contact tracing is important. It's just a remarkable time. And I'm, again, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be surrounded by a county board that cares I'm grateful to be surrounded by department heads and staff who really are 
dedicated, who really care. We are, we're so fortunate in Sheboygan County. But it occurred to me as I was driving back last week, and, and uh, I think the sheriff put something out in Facebook, and I asked my assistant to look at that a little bit more today, and, and I'd like you to reflect a little bit on what were you doing 18 years ago on October 11th, 2002, when one of the deadliest crashes in Wisconsin history occurred on I-43. I bet as most of you, if not all of you in this room, can remember that day, maybe remember exactly where you were. Just north of the Ozaki Sheboygan County line, a multi-vehicle crash that involved 50 vehicles. Some of you may have known people involved or family members of people involved caused by a low visibility, foggy skies, just one of those days that we can periodically happen, have happen here. Hopefully we never see it like that again. 39 people sustained injuries that day and 10 individuals lost their lives. We had emergency responders go out to that accident scene. Some of them had never seen anything like it in their lives. Some of them needed counseling. It's horrible. What if that happened today? What if that happens next week? Are we ready to respond like we did in 2002? Are the hospitals ready for that number of people to come rolling into their emergency rooms or their ICUs? Do we have the staff resources? At present, approximately 80% of our ICU and medical surgical beds are occupied. Eighty percent. Well, that's a once-in-a-lifetime accident. What are the odds of that happening again? Well, let's just look at day-to-day. -day. Two car crashes happen every day, sadly. People are hurt every day. People have strokes and heart attacks every day. I was looking at the ambulance calls. Demand continues to increase. In 2010, there were 4,224 ambulances dispatched. In 2015, 7,400. And last year, in 2019, 9,469 ambulances were dispatched to people in crisis. On average, about 25 ambulance runs a day. Are we ready? Are our hospitals in good shape? Do they have the beds and the staff resources to meet that need? I think if the hospital leaders were standing here before you right now, they would say, well, we're okay yet. We, we can help people as needed. We can move resources around. We still have some beds available. Don't panic. We're okay. We're at 80% today. We could be at 100% a month from now. How many ICU beds does Sheboygan County have in total? Anybody know? 12. 12. We all have different views, right? Different political views. We've heard a lot of feedback from Brian Hoffman when people call in. <laughs> we all have different viewpoints, which is good, which is healthy. And we all have different points of view on COVID. 
Some of us in this community, this country, take it, this world, right, are taking it very, very seriously, in my opinion, as they should. Others, well, I'm healthy. I'm strong. Most people, it doesn't impact that, that bad. Most people recover. Maybe they don't take it quite as seriously. They know it's real. They're tough. And then there still are some that still think it's a hoax or made up or I don't know where they're coming from. But there still are people who absolutely, they just don't care. I trust if there's one thing we all share in common in this community, every single one of us, every single one of us, is none of us want to see our hospitals overwhelmed. None of us want to see our hospitals overwhelmed. Because if it's our children, or our friends, or our parents, or our spouse, or whoever it may be, when that ambulance comes to that door, that emergency responder comes to help, we believe they're going to be taken to a hospital that's going to be able to care for them and have the beds and the staff resources they need to take care of our family and our friends and our neighbors and our residents. We all expect that. I'd like to introduce Star Grossman, who you all know very well. Star, if you could please come forward. Star's been our public health officer now throughout this incredible, challenging time. And as I said, Star, and I see her, one of her co-workers, Amanda, with us today. They have just such wonderful people working in public health. I've gotten to know them like I never have in my career over the last couple of decades. And I asked Star if she could give us a recap of where we're at today. Obviously, this is so incredibly important. I could give the recap. Star can do it better. Are you teed up with the PowerPoint, Star? All right. Mr. Chair, I'm going to turn it over to Star, and then she'll conclude. Thank you. Hey everybody, thank you so much uh, for having me today to just give you a little bit of an update about where we're at. Thank you, Adam, for, uh, for this introduction. So I'm just going to go through a quick update about what our current picture looks like so everyone can be aware of what we're seeing locally at this point. Uh, a little bit about what our health systems are um, experiencing and our Northeast region is experiencing some of our outbreak, um, outbreaks that we're seeing and some action steps that community members can take. So just a quick kind of recap, if you've been following along, we have been seeing a large numbers of positivity across the state of Wisconsin. Um, the uh, active cases to date are the highest that we've seen in Sheboygan County. We have 890 um, active cases at this point. Uh, we did see uh, an additional 200, over 200 cases come in today, positive cases, and that does not include KMCI cases. I know we get asked that a lot. So um, these are just new positive cases that we've gotten today. Um, this is the highest that we've seen for sure locally related to positivity in one day. And then our local hospitalization today was at 26. So that number is also continuing to rise pretty quickly. Um, as you can see, this is our hospitalization. So um, in July, we were averaging two or three people in the hospital at a time. Um, and you can see now in October, we're seeing much higher numbers of people hospitalized. Um, that's not a surprise. As we see more cases, we'll see more people hospitalized. At the state level, when you look at the data, about 5% of people become hospitalized if they're positive. So as we see more and more cases, we'll probably see more hospitalizations. So we have to prepare for that and do what we can to try and decrease the spread so that we can protect our hospitals and protect the beds that we have in our community. Um, this is a question that gets asked quite a bit, so I just put that in here, put it in here related to KMCI. We, have, we are experiencing a large outbreak at KMCI. Uh, the, cases, the positive cases from that outbreak are starting to decline, so we're not seeing as much positivity there as we were. But even without KMCI, KMCI's numbers, our average case rate is um, over 800 
cases, 854.8 um, per 100,000 without KMCI. So when you look at the um, Harvard Institute model, anything over 350 cases per 100,000 over a 14-day period is cause for concern. It points towards a um, widespread community transmission. So this, these numbers here are concerning because we're seeing such a large increase within our community. The large spread community transmission indicates that it's more likely that you're gonna get it when you're out in the community grocery shopping or whatever the things that you're going out into the community to do because there's so much going on in our community, your risks are higher when you go out. Related to our Northeast regional healthcare, healthcare capacity, so the state releases data by region. Our hospital systems are in the Northeast region. Um, and so when we look at the number of hospital beds in use, at the um, 923, we had about 78% of hospital beds in use within our region. Um, and now uh, we're at 79, with 86% of our ICU beds used. If you look at the Southeast region, which is the other region that's on the direct side of us, we're kind of right on a border of two different regions, um, we're looking at um, close to 90% of those beds being um, in use. So when you're looking at healthcare systems, you can't just think about what's going on at our local hospital you have to look at the region because there's a lot of things that happen if we need to transfer someone out, if our beds are looking full and we need to move a patient to another location, there has to be another location to move patients to. So we're looking at our regional capacity to see, you know, how does that look, what's going on with that. So, so we are seeing some increases in um, regional bed use across both regions. So just to update about our seven-day rolling average. So we've been looking at what is our rolling average for positive um, cases that are hospitalized locally. So when we look at that seven-day rolling average, when you look at um, where we were a couple months ago, we were like averaging, like I said, about two cases per day in the hospital. Now our seven-day rolling average out of, as of 1017 was 9.14 confirmed positive cases per day. So um, we are seeing that increase quite a bit. Um, the ICU use for COVID positive patients has nearly doubled. The medical surgical beds needed for COVID positive patients has nearly tripled. So we are seeing quite an increase locally. As Adam mentioned, uh, about 80% of our local beds are currently occupied. And that's with all of the patients that we're seeing within the community. So that's not just COVID patients, but that's everybody. So impacts to our hospital system, we've been having a lot of conversations with our hospital system about what does this increase in positivity mean for your system? Like what is the qualitative measures that we don't necessarily know about that are happening behind the scenes that, that make an impact? So um, some of the things that have come up just so people know, uh, the length of stay for a COVID patient is typically longer than what they see for other infections. And so that can have a bottlenecking um, or like compounding effect for hospitalizations because people might stay in the hospital longer. Um, as COVID cases increase in the community, it becomes more difficult to discharge patients to alternative care sites that they can go to. Um, as um, Adam mentioned, we're seeing COVID in lots of different places. So we see it in long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities, home health agencies who might have um, cases of COVID. And so that impacts our ability to discharge people um, to places where there isn't COVID because um, we don't, those places that are experiencing COVID don't take admission. So then that can limit or kind of lengthen stay in that way as well. Higher volumes of COVID positive patients um, can make it complicated to transfer patients out. And we talked about that a little bit with the regional capacity changing from the Northeast region, Southeast region. If those beds are full, then it's harder to transfer patients. So those are all pieces that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about hospital capacity. Um, and then, um, as I said, 90% of our hospital beds are in use um, within, the, within the regions. So um, those are two pieces that we're uh, monitoring. All of those pieces put together, we're monitoring really closely. So I know we've talked a lot about how many beds are available, and that is just one piece of the picture. So we're trying to work with our hospital systems, and we talk with them regularly to see what's going on in their system and how can we better support them. Um, and we know that um, it's going to take action from everybody to support our hospital systems and to support the um, community members that are most vulnerable. So 
um, some of the things that we're asking the community to do, and this is um, nothing new, I think, that we've been kind of shouting this from the mountaintops for uh, six months now, but we'll go, we'll keep, we'll keep shouting. Um, the Wisconsin Department of Health did issue some orders around this, but we're encouraging people um, to follow those um, emergency orders related to limiting public gatherings. Those just came out recently. Um, physically distance from others at least six feet away from other people. Wear a mask. Um, don't gather with people outside of your household if you can, if you can help it. Limit outdoor gatherings to 10 people or fewer. Um, Self-monitor for symptoms. So if you are feeling sick, stay home. Um, consider getting tested if you're symptomatic. And we are increasing testing capacity or trying to increase testing capacity in our community. We did open up the National Guard testing site um, last week. That was our first week doing, doing it. And it went, it was much busier than we anticipated. We, we um, were able to use up all of the tests that first day and the second day. So we're um, excited about that. And then stay home if you test positive. If you test positive, don't go to work and watch for communications from public health. If each of us take that like personal action, um, it's basically saying to our healthcare workers and the people in our hospital systems that you care enough to stay home, to cancel the slumber party, to not go to the sporting event. That is a, a high five to that nurse that's working in the ICU um, because we need those beds to be available. And the more that we can work together to slow the spread, the more we can protect those, those vulnerable populations and keep them out of our hospitals. Um, community action. So this was also in our October 8th update um, when we sent out this uh, action alert that came out. We worked collaboratively and put out an action alert with multiple health systems um, and some of our business partner, uh, community partners to just say that we are taking this seriously and these are some of the actions that we're recommending and we continue to recommend those actions. So certainly businesses should be following the WEDC guidelines, um, promoting uh, opportunities for remote work, which I'm really thankful to work for Sheboygan County. They, um, as an employer, have really stepped into this remote work as an opportunity, and um, it's been a, a real blessing for our staff in public health as well. So think, I'm thankful for that. Um, to the extent possible, limiting person-to-person -person contact when you're doing bars, restaurants, hospitality, so encouraging curbside pickup and delivery options. So when you're making personal decisions for yourself, instead of going out to that restaurant, order ahead of time, pick it up at the curb. Those are little things that you can do to make a big difference. Um, require masking and face coverings. Don't go to large gatherings and don't hold large gatherings. Um, limit any kind of gathering to 10 people or fewer if possible. And then um, concerts, festivals, sporting events, all of those events are not really recommended at this time because we have such high numbers. We, want to, we do not want to create an event that is an opportunity for the germ to be spread to other people. So those are the, the actions that we're really recommending and really hoping our community will lean into. And um, you know, as we've seen things ramp up so much over the last two weeks, um, it becomes so important for us all to kind of rally around these issues together and, and um, be part of the solution. So I appreciate the opportunity to share kind of where public health is at, what we're seeing locally, and then um, how that corresponds to actions that everyone can take. So thank you so much for that time. Okay, thank you, Star. And we move on to consideration of committee reports, executive committee. Resolution number 15 regarding authorizing the issuance and sale of $4,166,000 of taxable General obligation refunding bonds. Committee recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move for to adopt resolution number 15. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Supervisor Obler. I'll support the adoption of resolution 15 also. Thank you, Supervisor Obler. Is there, is there any discussion? We could use a motion to amend. No. Supervisor Testrodi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll move to amend the resolution by replacing the original resolution with the new revised version 
emailed by the county clerk, clerk's office on October 16th. Thank you, Supervisor Custody. Supervisor Gary? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Gary. Any discussion? Okay. Just waiting for it to be typed in properly. Correct. Okay, then all those in favor of the amendment or against, please vote. The amendment's approved unanimously. Okay, and now we will be voting on the original resolution number 15. As soon as it is taped in properly. Okay, please vote. Resolutions approved unanimously. Okay, thank you for your patience. Resolution number 14. Regarding reaffirming membership in Wisconsin Bay Workforce Development Area Consortium and approval of amended consortium agreement recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Damp. Thank you, Chairman Fouch. I will move to adopt resolution 14. Thank you, Supervisor Damp. Supervisor Nelson. Second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Nelson. Under discussion? Okay, if there's no discussion, please vote. Resolutions approved unanimously. Okay, now I hand the gavel over to the vice chair. Good evening to you all. Resolutions introduced. Resolution number 16. From Planning Resources, Agriculture, and Extension Committee regarding approving joint development agreement with Onion River Solar LLC for utility revenue sharing. Resolution number 16 will be referred to transportation. Ordinance is introduced. Ordinance number four from Human Resources Committee regarding increasing compensation and pay ranges for non bargaining unit personnel and implementing across the board wage increases for 2021. Ordinance number four will be referred to finance. Ordinance number five from the Law Committee regarding modifying fee schedule of medical examiner in Chapter 96. Ordinance number five will be referred to finance. I'll kindly ask. Supervisor Distruti, to begin the next order of business. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll move to adjourn. Supervisor Hoffman. I will second that. Please vote. 